<laughs> on this street in the outskirts of Manila, these teenagers are untouchable. They've named their gang Visconde, after the victims of one of the Philippines' most gruesome murder cases in the 90s. Many of them live a life of crime and have no qualms admitting it. Their weapon of choice, guns, illegally purchased and improvised. This, for example, is what they call sumpa, which works basically like a slingshot, except it's loaded with a bullet. The guns these boys possess are just a few of the more than 600,000 illegal firearms estimated to have proliferated throughout the country. Welcome to this special edition of Assignment in Asia. I'm Barnaby Lo. Despite its recent economic boom, the Philippines has had a hard time shaking off its wild, wild west image. And for good reason. The homicide rate here at close to 9 for every 100,000 people is three times Asia's average and almost twice that of the United States. So tonight we ask, is the Philippines' gun culture to blame? And can a stricter gun control law lead to better peace and order? Bagong Silang, in the outskirts of Manila, is a community of free settlers. Meaning, residents here were moved from different slum areas where crime rate tends to be high. Most of Bagong Silang doesn't look anything like Manila slums. But crime here, including gun-related crimes, is rampant. These boys regularly get into trouble and talk about it like it's nothing. But while these fights are between rival gangs, Innocent bystanders have become unwitting victims. But what if there wasn't even a riot and you unsuspectingly get shot? That's what happened to Arthur Castillo and Nashville Regina, who both grew up in Bagunsila. Eh, mama po kami. Nang ginuman na kami, may dumating na dalawang motor. Sinasakaan to kami. Ang kita ko na yun, dalawang motor na yun, parating. Gal galing dito. Hindi ko pinansin yun. Eh, pag maghinto, kala na kami magtatanong. Hindi kala na nagpaputok. Siyempre, nagulat kami dahil hindi naman po namin expect na ganun po mangyayari na pagbabarilin pa na po kami. Nakita ko po yung dalawa kong kasama, bagsak na. Ito pa tayo katakbo na pinagbabaril din, kaya bumagsak na siya, hindi niya alam. Ako po ngayon yung babarili pa ulit, nakatakbo ako. Eh, bala na rin po, kung tamaan o hindi. Pinaputokan na lang nila ako, pero ito, takbo ako, dire-direcho na lang ako, tumakbo eh. Arthur survived, but was in critical condition for a while. Nashvin was somehow able to escape, but so did the gunmen. This type of drive-by shooting, where gunmen ride on motorcycles in pairs, have become so common, it's earned the name Riding in Tandem. So common that if there are two of you on a motorcycle, you can most certainly expect to get stopped and searched by cops at some point. Still, it has been a daunting task trying to apprehend those riding in tandem. One challenge has been getting victims to cooperate. Arthur and Nashville say they didn't see their assailants' faces. It's where they don't know anyone who could possibly have any vendetta against them. So they thought it was best not to report the incident to police. Unang-una po, hindi po namin sila kilala. Tapos, wala ko rin yung ebidensyang basyuman na lalalaglag. Sa daming putok na ko yung wala akong basyum bumagsak eh. Kasi pag ano, kamaya, makilala ko man sila. Sabi ko yung ano, di balikan pa ako nila. May takot din nung ako eh. 
Siyempre, may harap na. Ang buhay na ako, may abalikan pa ako nila. Arthur and Nashvin aren't the only ones who've decided to keep quiet. Many more shooting incidents in the Philippines may be unknown to authorities. One reason, perhaps, gun-related crimes have become so frequent and more brazen. The most glaring example is the massacre of close to 60 people in the southern Philippines on the 23rd of November in 2009. The victims were found in a mass grave. Some mutilated, the women raped, all killed in broad daylight. When government troops searched properties of the suspected masterminds, then Magindanao Governor Andalam Butuan Sr. and other members of the clan, they found a cache of high-powered weapons enough to arm an entire battalion. Where the firearms were sourced is unclear. What's clear is that they're illegal, and loose firearms had often been linked to the rise in criminality in this country. So we've arranged a meeting with a man whose job is apparently to kill people. Now, this man has no permanent address for obvious safety reasons. He moves from place to place, so he's asked us to meet him at this nondescript neighborhood. When we met him, he was covered from head to foot. He introduced himself as Bruno. He made sure we'd have no way of recognizing him when we part ways. Unlike most assassins nowadays, however, Bruno likes to work alone. His clients, he says, are mostly politicians and businessmen. And while he used to make more than $600 for a job, the going rate now, he says, is down to a couple of hundred dollars. He admits he's gotten used to killing and even enjoys it. Parang hinahanap na ng katawan ko ito. Alin ang hinahanap ng katawan? Yung makapagpatumba ng tao. Yung kumita sa ganyang paraan. He says he somehow mastered the science of it and has gotten used to evading authorities. Obtaining guns is even easier. Madali kumuha ng loose firearms dito sa Pilipinas? Madali. Basta sa parting probinsya. O kung may konta ka sa loob. Anong loob? Sa AFP, ganyan. Madaling makapaglabas ng mga ano, loose firearms yung mga... Gano'n ka, gano ka dali? Gano'n ka dali? Basta may pera ka lang. May pambili ka. Still, he insists he does it only for the money and that he chooses his clients and victims. Sa umpisa, nakakakonsent lang. Kasi, siyempre, buhay pa rin yan eh. Pero nung mga nakakaapat limang buhay na, nawala yung konsensya kasi eh. Pag inaalam ko naman yung background ng nadadali ko, salot din naman sa lipunan yun. Nagpapahirap sa may hirap. Diba? Nananakit ng mga taong walang laban. Diba? Kaya hindi rin ako na ano sa kanila ng pagsisisi. Exactly how many Brunos there are out there, who knows? But with people getting gunned down almost on a daily basis, there's no question. Many are cashing in. Illicit gun traders are obviously having a field day. Those who are legally manufacturing and selling guns, not so. They claim business has gone from bad to worse since the government implemented a new gun control law. So has the government's effort to stamp out illegal firearms backfire? When we come back, we'll walk you through both sides of the gun control debate in the Philippines and why a new gun control law that authorities had hoped would put an end to gun-related violence seems to be creating more problems. Stay with us on Assignment Asia. In June 2013, Philippine President Benigno Aquino III enacted a new gun control law. It was supposed to modernize the registration and licensing of firearms. It was also supposed to raise the standards and requirements for acquiring a license and permit to carry. But the law has been hit with opposition from both sides of the debate. So much so that the Supreme Court has been asked to intervene. We've come to the annual Defense and Sporting Arms Show. 
Philippines' preeminent gun show. From 9mm pistols to 45 caliber handguns, to carbines and even long arms, from high end to low end, locally made and imported. If you want a gun, you'll find it here. It's a gun enthusiast's heaven. And judging by the crowd here, there are plenty in the Philippines. We have a very strong gun culture uh, for two reasons, uh, primarily because of sport. Uh, people like to compete uh, in a practical uh, shooting competition. And also um, the other aspect is uh, self-defense. Ernesto Tabujara is the public face of the pro-gun lobby. He says owning a gun is a need for Filipinos. It's a need uh, with respect to crime, uh, insurgency, and uh, terrorism. And now, under a new gun control law, it has also become a right. Republic Act 10591, or the Comprehensive Firearms and Ammunition Regulation Act, signed into law in 2013, requires all gun owners to obtain a new license before they can register their guns. To get the license, they must get court clearances, pass psychiatric and drug tests, and submit several other documents. When it was first implemented in 2014, it also required gun owners to register only in the main police headquarters in Manila. If this sounds like a lot, it's because it is, according to Tabuhara. And there are a list of about 15 requirements. So those have to be done personally. Now, if you're a working person or you have a job, that's a five-day process. It has practically become a joke or it's impossible to, to license a firearm in the Philippines. Senior Superintendent Elmo Sarona, the third officer to head the Firearms and Explosives Office of the Philippine National Police since the law was implemented, disagrees. I believe that it's a matter of uh, uh, getting familiar with the requirements set forth under, this, uh, uh, under the provision of the law. Uh, I can see the trend that the applicants that we, are, that we have been receiving since uh, four months when I assume office uh, are increasing. Sarona, however, acknowledges that the law currently being questioned in the Supreme Court is far from perfect and that it still is, in his own words, a work in progress. For example, um, in the main law, we should require MPC and RTC clearance, meaning the court clearance, and uh, they find that uh, very hard and uh, a very tedious process. So instead of MPC and RTC clearance, an NBI clearance will do. Soon, regional centers may also be able to process gun licensing and registration. In fact, police personnel were present at this year's Gun Expo to process licenses. But the licensed dealers and manufacturers also present at the show are far from being in a celebratory mood. In 2014, they reported an estimated 90% drop in sales. That's hardly something to celebrate. Roli de Leon, the owner of one of the country's leading gun manufacturers, Shooter's Arms, wanted us to see firsthand how his business has suffered as a result of the new gun law. So he invited us to his plant in the central Philippine island of Cebu. This assembly line right here, this used to be full of workers. Yes, full of workers. I had uh, 580 workers before. Now, virtually everywhere you turn in the factory, there are empty corridors, empty desks, and empty chairs. They haven't stopped making guns, but production has been scaled back significantly. Why has business been so bad this past year? What happened? Because of the new policy, anybody who wants to buy guns has to apply directly to the PNP head office in Tamkrami, Quezon City, or through the regional offices which is very hard and impossible for other people who wants to buy guns to apply, especially those living in the remote areas. The practice of having legitimate gun dealers process licenses on behalf of customers has been outlawed. All of a sudden, gun owners and would-be owners are being made to go through the rigors of the bureaucracy, something they're not used to, something the Leon believes 
has discouraged them to purchase new guns legally. We used to sell 100 to 150 pieces assorted guns per week. Now, it's good if you can sell 5 to 10 pieces per week. Unfortunately, that means having to also scale back on manpower. From more than 500, the Leon now has fewer than 100 gunsmiths, doing everything from forging and casting iron and steel to machining them to more precise dimensions, cutting, shaping, and then treating them with chemicals before the final assembly. The choice to put up this plant in Cebu was not just a coincidence. The island has a thriving underground gun industry. Unsanctioned, unlicensed gunsmiths abound. Leon had already pulled to hire. The reason why they were employed by me because they don't like also that uh, for the rest of their life they'll be making illegal guns. And with me, because I hired them, their life be, uh, was already in a, a normal situation that they are being paid minimum and then plus their SSS, pill health, and pag All the benefits that is due to them, we give it to them. Okay. And, and minus the risk of getting being captured, captured arrested. arrested. Yeah. Right. But now they don't have any choice. No. They are forced to go back to their old trade of making illegal guns again. That. De Leon believes it's where all the business is right now. Whether you like it or not, people will really buy guns for their personal and family protection. That's the reason why uh, the illegal manufacturer, especially in Danao, has reason. We wanted to see for ourselves how much this underground gun industry has flourished. So we traveled to the seaside town of Danao. What we discovered is one that has thrived for generations. Danao is just an hour's drive away from Cebu City. But life here is far from the hustle and bustle of the Philippines' second major city. Driving along the main highway, we see a town that's mostly typical of rural Philippines. Economic activity appears to be dependent on the sea and mountains that surround the area. Until we actually go deep into the mountains. We've come to a mountain village in Danao. It's a city just north of downtown Cebu. Now, the city is known for its gun making industry, but gunsmiths here are mostly home based and they're not licensed to make guns. So most of them were not willing to talk to us, but we managed to convince one to show us how they make guns here. He introduced himself as Ricky. And this small hut is his workshop. Mano mano yung gawa niyo dito. Hmm, mano mano. Paano? Paano? Pa eh, pakipaliwanag mo nga sa akin paano kayo gumagawa ng barilyo dito. Sa umpisa, para doon kumpara doon sa ano sa factory. Oh, sa umpisa yan eh bumili kami ganyan. Ganyan pang ganyan pang itsura. Ah, alin yung bakal? Oh, oh. Ah. Tapos kami na yung i-discard diyan. Oh. Para magawa lang yung baril. Oh. So talagang ano, from scratch talaga. Mm hmm. The now gunsmiths can make copies of a variety of firearms, from Smith & Wesson revolvers to pistols and Uzi submachine guns. Ricky says his guns are not top quality, but they're comparable to the average guns available in the market. He actually spends a great deal of time crafting them, two weeks on average for each gun. But while the now guns are in demand, he says he can barely make ends meet. Sabi mo mahirap ang kita? Bakit? Kami gumagawa, meron kaming buyer, pero hindi naman buyer na mataas yung gawa, hmm. yung bayad. Hmm. Ibig sabihin tatlo dito ang kuha niyo. Hindi naman yung kami ang direct ah, okay. sa buyer. So ibig sabihin may, may middleman? Oo. Oh, 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 oh. okay. So ako mo commission yan? Oo. Oh, oh. okay. So ako tulad ito? Ito? Halimbawa ito, magkano? Bebenta mo. Malaki na yung 8,000 eh. Okay. Hmm. Tapos magkano lang yung mapupunta sa inyo yan? Kulang-kulang 3,000. 3,000? Hmm. Tapos eh, dalawang linggo? Oo, oh, tapos niya, 
Ibili ka lang ulit ng scrap. So, ibig mo sabihin, parang konti na lang matitira para sa konti na lang. Mo? Konti na lang. And if he had a chance, he says he probably wouldn't be making guts. But he doesn't. He didn't finish school. This is what he's been doing almost all his life. Sino bang buibili sa inyo dito? Eh, hindi namin kilala yung bahay. Eh. Pasensya na sa itatanong ko, pero yung gawa mo kasing ba rin, syempre, illegal. Hindi yan ma-rehistro, di ba? Illegal po. Uh -huh. So, mapupunta siya sa mga tao din na gagamit. Illegal din. Naiisip mo ba yun? Na baka criminal yung gagamit? Ganun. Eh, naiisip mo yan eh. Kasi ganyan yung ginamit yung mga criminal eh. Pero sa umpisa lang. Parang makukonsensya ka. Pero wag mo na lang yung ilagay sa isip mo na lahat ng tao kung magkagunit yun eh masama. If his guns end up in the hands of a hired assassin, or street gangs, or the private armies of powerful politicians or businessmen, he'd rather not find out. There are efforts to legalize the now gun industry. But until that happens, it remains one of the most well-known sources of illegal guns in the country. Pro-gun lobbyists are more concerned, however, about a whole new category of illicit firearms the new gun law may have created. The licensing and registration of legitimate firearms is so difficult that practically making it impossible for the licensed gun owners to comply with the law. So that is the first problem. So that creates a whole lot of loose firearms because expired licenses are actually uh, equivalent to loose firearms or illegal firearms. Anti-gun advocates, on the other hand, are worried the law hasn't just inadvertently increased the number of loose firearms in the country, but that it actually encourages an unlimited number of guns to proliferate. We're talking of type 1 license for those individuals who can own not more than two guns, type two license, not more than five guns, type three license, not more than 10 guns, type four license, not more than 15 guns, and type five, more than 15 guns. That's infinite number. So police officials would say that this law advocates stricter compliance. Does that not make the situation better for you? Not at all because uh, the law is not entirely new in the sense that uh, the policy of the government on gun trade, on gun ownership and gun possession has been the same all along. And uh, this law only made the, the ownership of firearms into a right rather than a privilege. So it made it worse. A policy that allows people to carry guns outside of homes no? into public places um, gives the police a harder time to separate the criminals from the, from the non-criminals. Officials, however, remain confident that the law can help reduce gun-related crimes. I would rather have a firearm accounted for than a, a, a firearm unaccounted for, so much so that it would be easier for a law enforcement agency to investigate and to pinpoint or identify the perpetrator. That would be ideal, especially for gun victims like Arthur and Nashvin. But the implementation of the law thus far has not inspired confidence in the police and trust among ordinary Filipinos in their police force has long been broken. So much so that Arthur and Nashvin would rather forget about justice. And self-confessed criminals like these boys continue to walk Manila streets. Since the time the Philippines' new gun control law was first implemented, the Philippine National Police has undergone changes in leadership. And with each change, it's shown some willingness to listen and adapt to criticism. But that middle ground has yet to be completely found by all parties. And it remains to be seen whether this law can indeed make a dent in the Philippine National Police's efforts to fight crime. That's all for this edition of Assignment Asia. You can watch this 
and all our stories on our website, www.simit-asia.com. You can also share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media. I'm Barnaby Lowe. Thanks for watching. Join us again on Assignment Asia.